How is it going? Okay, so I think that we can start. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining this lecture 21 about uh, graphics processing units uh, corresponding to this um, uh, digital design and computer architecture course. Uh, today I'm giving this lecture uh, because Professor Mudlu unfortunately uh, cannot do, him, do it himself. My name is Juan Gomez Luna and I'm one of the TAs. Before we start with the materials, let me remind you that there is an extra assignment in our website about uh, Andal's law, about uh, this paper from Jean Andal, and you can get to 1% uh, extra credit uh, for uh, this assignment. Recall that the deadline is on June 15th. So we strongly recommend you to use uh, or uh, to use or um, uh, guidelines on how to review the papers analytically. Here you have some links in the slide and also some example reviews. So let's very quickly recap what uh, are different things that we, we have covered in this course. We started with the microarchitectures like the single cycle and the multi-cycle uh, microarchitectures. Then uh, we visited pipelining and the different issues with pipelining and then out of order execution after these paradigms or uh, execution techniques apply um, to um, um, uh, CPUs, we have seen also other execution paradigms. For example, um, fine grain multithreading or uh, superscalar execution, systolic arrays, and now we are covering CIMD processors. In this lecture, we are going to first finish, finish with CIMD processors, a lecture that you started last Friday, and then we are going to cover GPUs. Let me also remind you what are the wire readings for this week. Uh, the, the required reading is the NVIDIA and I strongly recommend is a uh, paper about uh, MMX extensions in uh, Intel architecture. We are actually going to talk about these MMX extensions today. Okay, let's very quickly recap on CIMD processors. CIMD processors and also GPU by extension because they are kind of specialized or uh, improved CMD processors are very good at exploiting data parallelism. Uh, in particular, they're especially good at exploiting regular data parallelism. And we say that it's regular when all the different processing elements that we have in a CMD functional unit put the same instruction. That's why we call this paradigm or this class of computer according to Flynn's taxonomy, CMD single operation or single instruction on multiple data elements. This is one of the four classes of uh, computers according to Flynn's taxonomy. Uh, uh, among these CMD processors, seeing in the course uh, two main ones, two uh, main types of CMD processors, which are array and vector processors. And let's recap what's the difference between them. In an array processor, we have one instruction operating on multiple data and executing at on different processing elements, on different spaces. On a vector processor, have the single instruction executing multiple data in, multiple, in consecutive time steps, the same space. I think it's very clear this slide. The array processor, there are some uh, elements, all of them can execute different types of instructions like load, add, multiply, etc. We have uh, the same operation at the same time on different processing elements, and we have different operations in the same space, in the same uh, processing element. While in the vector processor, we typically have kind of specialized processing elements for load, add, multiply, etc. And um, here we execute the same operation in the same space that is in the same uh, processing element while different operations at the same time in different processing elements. Recall also that these vector processors need to access data and the way of accessing data is going to memory. And there in memory, if we really want to be able to access uh, in parallel, we need to uh, have a memory that allows us to do so. In order 
to do that, we divide the memory to independent banks that can be accessed independently. Um, and this way we are able to sustain as many concurrent accesses to memory as banks we have. Recall also how uh, vector instructions are executed on the pipeline of these uh, processing elements that compose either um, uh, array processors or vector processors. We can have a very simple uh, SIMD processor with a single uh, SIMD unit like this one in the figure where we will have to run uh, one by one, execute one by one the different um, um, operations that these, this vector addition contains. We can have several of these uh, ALUs and this way we can also execute uh, concurrently in the space. We usually group these uh, functional units that compose a uh, whole SIMD engine or whole SIMD functional units, we group them into what we call lanes. Each of these lanes is typically composed by different, uh, several of these uh, ALUs and they have access to a certain number, certain amount as they are needed uh, for um, the execution of the operations in these ALUs. We talk about a whole register file that is partitioned and each of the partition is assigned to one lane. Here you have another view of how a, um, uh, SIMD instructions are executed on the SIMD pipeline. In this particular example, we consider a vector length of 32. So we have 32 elements um, inside each vector and inside each vector register, but we only have eight lanes. So if we want to execute, for example, this load instruction using these eight lanes, we'll have to issue uh, eight uh, operations every cycle, and we will need four to issue the whole vector of 32 elements. And this is for the load uh, operation, and then we may have a multiply operation on a different unit, um, an addition, and then another load, uh, multiplication, and addition. And observe the big advantage that we have here in SIMD processors is that uh, all of these operations that you can see here represented by these small uh, color icons in total 24 are executing at the same time in the same cycle. So that's the big advantage, the ability to exploit regular data parallelism. But there are also disadvantages. As you may remember, this is like difficult. It's hard for a programmer to be able to uh, pack the data in the necessary way to, uh, to use SIMD instructions and to use these SIMD engines efficiently. Uh, luckily, over time, compilers have improved and they have manage ways of generating big vectorized code automatically. So recall uh, this example. It's a very simple code, like a vector addition. We have a for loop. Uh, we go over two arrays, B and a third array, which is the output array C, uh, composed of N elements. And in each iteration of the loop, we read one element from A, we read one element from B, we add them, and we store the result uh, in C. In total here, we have N iterations, right? Uh, and the way that these iterations are going to execute on a regular single threaded CPU or single core CPU is uh, something like this. We will first load uh, an element of A or element zero of A, then element zero of B, then we add them and then we start in C zero, right? And then we go to uh, iteration one, so, sorry, iteration two. So the good thing here is that uh, there, is, uh, there are a lot of independent instructions. So we can execute what we call instruction level parallelism. For example, this addition here is completely independent of this addition here. So they can execute in parallel. And this is something that the compiler can realize and based on that, generate vectorized code. Something like this, uh, the, 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 the compiler can identify what instructions can be packed together. This load here, this load here will be part of a vector load instruction and then another vector load instruction and then a vector add and then vector store. So this way we can create code automatically, automatically and efficiently. 
important issue here is that we obviously require extensive loop date dependence analysis. The compiler should be able to realize by itself that all these iterations are independent and then generate the vector S code. So in order to summarize about vector or SIMD or array uh, processors, they are very good at exploiting regular data level parallelism. They perform the same operation on multiple data elements. Clearly we can improve performance because we can execute operations in parallel, instructions in parallel. However, this performance improvement is limited by the vectorizability of the code. Well, uh, uh, it's, it's limited by how much parallel code we, uh, parallel sections we really have in the code. This is why, and this is uh, something that uh, Gene Andal himself realized, even though he was the um, inventor and developer of uh, one of the uh, first uh, supercomputers, Cray-1, which was composed by hundreds of uh, parallel execution units that could execute uh, in SIMD instructions. He was also conscious about the importance of a fast execution of the non-parallelizable code, the sequential code. That's why Cray-1 was also not only the fastest machine, but also the fastest or a scalar machine of its time. Um, today, uh, we still have many CMD operations in many different systems like Intel, I, uh, IBM, PowerPC, ARM, etc. We are going to talk about a couple of examples today. Recall Andal's law, the speed up that we can get in a program where there is some parallelism depends on what's the parallelizable fraction of the program because this is the only part of the program that we can really speed up by using the whatever number of processors we have. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the paper that, as you know, is um, uh, suggested uh, reading an extra assignment and that you can submit until, until June 15. And here are some links to the guidelines. This is the beginning of the paper. And if you want more, uh, to know more about parallelism and heterogeneous execution programs with uh, parallel side parts and sequential parts. You can watch this lecture by Professor Mutlu from the Computer Architecture Master's it's lecture uh, 16B. Here you have another one that analyzes more in detail uh, sequential bottlenecks, in this case, multiprocessors. And this one is about bottleneck acceleration. What can I do to accelerate the bottlenecks in these codes that, okay, they are great because they have some part of the code that is parallelizable and I execute it for example, using CMD operations, but some other is uh, inherently sequential not too much. I cannot parallelize. There are also ways of uh, speeding up, for example, these critical, critical sections, with, which are sections of code that where only a single thread can uh, be executing at the same time. There is no possible concurrency. Here you have the links to these lectures. So we will uh, very soon finish uh, CMD operations, processors, but now we are going to see a couple of examples of CMD operations in modern processors and in modern ISAs. The very first one are all the CMD applications that we can find in, for example, x86 processors or ARM processors as well. Um, <clears throat> the idea of uh, including CMD extensions, kind of CMD functional units inside these um, general purpose CPUs uh, came from uh, the I, I would say 80s or 90s when uh, multimedia applications start being more and more used and more and more important. Um, at that point, vendors realized that these applications could greatly benefit from the use of CMD extensions. Um, essentially, the idea is that uh, uh, multimedia applications like audio, video, graphics, or games, they have a lot of parallelism, for example, in video or in graphics, uh, what we need to generate are images composed by pixels. And it's very typical that the computation that we apply on these pixels is the same. So there is a lot of regularity there, a lot of uh, regular data parallelism that we can exploit. One um, 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 additional uh, consideration here is that we may not need to use like very uh, high, pre pre highly precise data values. We may not need to use uh, 64 bit or 32 bit per pixel. We typically use much smaller representations like a single byte per pixel or maybe several bytes if we have a color image and each of the bytes represents one channel of the image. 
So the idea here is that we can modify the ALUs that we already have in the system for 32-bit operations, and we can operate on several bytes or at least several smaller data types at the same time. Here in the, in the figure, you can see uh, uh, this, this will be like a 32-bit adder uh, where we are going to add uh, all the bits, uh, all the, these uh, elements in this register to the elements in this other register. The only modification or the main modification that we, we need to do in the ELU is um, eliminating the carry from bit seven to bit eight or from bit 15 to bit 16. And in this way, we'll be able to perform an here, an independent addition here, and it, an independent addition here, and so on. Okay, so this is like the key idea uh, that um, uh, Cindy extensions on general purpose uh, CPUs are based on. Let's take a closer look at the Intel Pentium MMX operations as an example of this Cindy extension. So the thing is that if you have, for example, a 64-bit other or ALU, you can operate on 64-bit elements, or you can operate on two 32-bit elements at once, or four 16-bit elements, or uh, eight bytes, right? Let's see, because recall, we have said before, it was difficult, it was a challenging program um, using CIND operations, right? Or CIND instructions. We are going to see now an example of uh, MMX, how to use MMX instructions. Uh, this is uh, a multimedia, let's say, a task that can be uh, parallelized using the CIND extension, the CIND MMX extension in an, in an Intel CPU. So uh, the, this example essentially consists of a, a main image where we have a woman and um, this woman is at the front of a um, this is what we call the chroma key and here the processing that we want to apply to this image is replacing the blue background with some blossom background this is for example uh, you, you you have seen in the tv uh, the weather forecasting right where the weather man or the weather woman uh, is at the front of a uh, the weather map. So this is the kind of technique that is used there. So that's what we are going to do here. In this case, we have a map of Switzerland uh, behind. What we are going to have is a blossom background. The computation that we need to perform here in reality is very, very simple. If you write the sequential code, it's as simple as going through the whole image, pixel by pixel. And in this image, if one particular pixel is blue, we are going to replace it with the corresponding pixel in the same position in this Y image. If it's not blue, then we will directly copy to the new image. So in order to do this on a CIMD processor or using CIMD MMX extensions, where well, the first thing that we have to do is to create a mask. Uh, the idea is that for every pixel of the image, the X image, we are going to check whether it's blue or not. And to do so, we compare each of the individual pixels that we will load into these vector registers, this, for example, vector register MN3. We compare all the individual bytes here with the uh, uh, a vector register MN1 that contains blue in every single uh, byte, right? So using these, uh, operation here, this instruction, which means packed, compare, uh, and well, byte. We compare one by one, and the output will contain zeros or one. And this is our bit mask that we are going to use uh, uh, in the um, um, subsequent computation. So, once we have the bit mask, let's see what we have to do with the blossom image and with the woman's image. Let's start with the blossom image. Recall that this is the uh, computation that we have from on a sequential processor. Uh, here uh, in the CMD uh, processor, we are using the mask. The thing to do is to load chunks of the blossom image into a register, in this case, MM4, and then we apply the mask. And the way that we apply the mask Remember that this mask some, has some bytes that are zero, some bytes that are one, uh, by using uh, PN, packed N. So what we do is element-wise, 
we do an and operation between a pixel of the blossom image and uh, the corresponding position of the uh, bit mask. So this is what we uh, um, finally have in, in, in register MM4. And then we have to do the corresponding computation for Emax, image X, the woman's image. So here, again, we are going to use the mask. Um, and, um, and here in MM3, we are going to load uh, of pixels of the um, image from, um, of the woman. Some of these pixels are blue, some others are the woman herself. And now what we do is again apply the mask, but observe that this instruction is different. It's not P and, it's P and not. This means that we first flip this mask and then we perform the end. So these zeros will be one, and then we do the end with these uh, elements here, and then we obtain this output. Uh, pixels from the woman and then zeros. So finally, we do a with uh, MM4 and MM1 as the input operands, and this is the result. This would be uh, the, the woman at the front of the blossom background. You can see here uh, how you would need to write this code. So <clears throat> let's see another example. Uh, seeing the operations in a modern accelerator, in machine learning accelerator. This is kind of optional material for sure. You have seen uh, these uh, Cerebras wafer scale engine that Professor Mudlu has shown on a previous um, um, lecture. It's an amazing uh, computing platform with uh, 400,000 cores in its version of 2019, the new version uh, uh, launched in 2021 has more than twice the number of cores. And and it's like, as you can see, compared to the largest GPU, for example, it's like several order of magnitudes more uh, transistors. Let's take a quick look at how this, uh, how we can use this uh, wafer scale engine. So uh, this is device, as, as we already know, is an accelerator for machine learning workloads. And for example, neural networks, as you know, they are composed by multiple layers. So the idea here is that we are going to map these layers onto the different cores, the different tiles of course that we have inside uh, the wafer scale engine. There might be different ways of uh, mapping these, right? For example, this uh, green layer goes here, the yellow layer goes here and so on. Here you have like a more detailed example where you can see where exactly each of these uh, convolutional or pooling layers are being mapped onto the wafer, wafer scale engine. And also you can see kind of the um, flow uh, of uh, data that you need to follow, right? In order to be able to follow all the different layers of the, uh, the uh, neural network. So interesting thing here is that we are using a whole machine, a whole computer. We are dividing it into different pieces and each of these parts is executing different computations, right? So this is something that we have called before a MIMDI machine, MIMDI multiple instructions, multiple data machine. It's, as you know, one of the four classes of computers according to Flynn's taxonomy. There is something else here. If we, let's take a look, a closer look at the, at the wafer scale engine. Here you have a pictorial representation of this uh, wafer scale engine. It's composed by a two-dimensional organization of 84 dice. And inside each of these dice, we have multiple tiles, more than 4,500 uh, 4, tiles. And each of these tiles is something like this. It's like a small core. But let's take a closer look at this uh, small core because the interesting thing here is that this small core is a SIMD processor. Um, can you hear me? You son? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I had a problem with um, um, PowerPoint. I'm reopening the presentation now. Okay, it should be coming now. Okay, let's continue. I hope you all see uh, this slide again. 
So yeah, I, as I was saying, the interesting thing is that each of these small cores that compose this Mindy machine is a CIMD processor. So this is a MIND machine composed by CIMD processors. Each of these CIMD processors, we know it's CIMD because it has a, um, a CIMD functional unit, which uh, is four way. So this means that it has four lanes. So it can execute four operations in parallel. And these operations are the important operations for machine learning, which are which is the fuse, multiply, accumulate um, operation. Um, we obviously need some operands to uh, operate using these FMAC CIMD units. Uh, to do so, we have some address registers and using these address registers access a local memory in total 48 kilobytes of SRAM. Okay, so until now, this is uh, our CIMD processors lecture. Now we're going to start talking, about, start talking about GPUs. Um, but before we start uh, talking about GPUs, I would like to remind you uh, find the fine grain multi threading uh, paradigm or fine grain, fine grain multi threading execution. Uh, because GPUs, as you already know, are related to CD processors, but they also uh, have the uh, ability of execute CD operations in a fine grain multi threaded manner. Uh, very, very quickly from a previous lecture by Professor Mudlu, um, recall the idea, the key idea of uh, fine grain multi threading. The key idea is that we have multiple hardware threads, multiple hard, uh, thread contexts, each of them with its own uh, PC and with uh, their own registers. And uh, what we do is that every cycle, we have a scheduler that takes one instruction from one of these threads and issues them, issues the instruction onto the pipeline. The main advantage of doing this is that while we are performing some long latency operations, like for example, going to memory to get uh, some data, we typically spend hundreds of cycles on getting data from the main memory of the computer. Or for example, while we are waiting for branches to get resolved, we can execute instructions from other threads. So this is the key advantage of fine grain multithreading, the ability to hide latencies that fine grain multithreaded processors, like for example, uh, hyper threading that you can find in most uh, Intel processors these days, but also GPUs use. Recall the lecture on fine grain multithreading was lecture 14 uh, in this semester. You can also find in this slide another lecture from a previous sem semester. The contents are essentially the same, but uh, it's a uh, explained uh, in a different way. Okay, so now let's start with uh, graphics processing units. We already know uh, that graphics processing units are based on CIMD processors and also based on fine grain multi-thread processors. So let's start with the CIMD side of the GPUs. GPUs are CIMD engines underneath. There is an instruction pipeline that operates like, an, like a CIMD pipeline. However, there is a main difference here is residing in the fact that we don't need to write vectorized code. We don't need to write to use vector instructions, but we are going to program this GPU using threads. And this is a key advantage from the programming perspective. We can uh, program much more efficiently if we just need to worry on threads individually rather than worrying on packing data on vector instructions and creating bit masks and launching these whole vector instructions onto, onto the hardware, right? We are going to discuss this uh, really thoroughly. Um, uh, and to understand this, we are going to use the same parallelizable code, the vector addition that we've seen in a previous slide. But before that, we are going to distinguish, or we have to distinguish between two important concepts here. One of them is a software concept, which is the programming model. The other one is a hardware concept, which is the execution model. They are uh, tightly related, but they are not the same. What's the programming model? The programming model refers to how the programmer expresses the code. It's like, how do I, as a programmer, write my code? I may do it in a sequential manner, uh, following phonoma model. I simply write the sequential code, instruction after instruction, 
I can write it in a data parallel manner, for example, using CIMD instructions, or you, I can use multiple threads in a MIMD or also called SPMD, single program multiple data manner, as we will see. Like for example, using Java threads or OpenMP threads or P threads um, and so on, different libraries like that, like that. And then we have the execution model is how the hardware executes the code underneath. And for that, we also have different ways of doing that, right? And you already know them. For example, you know that sequential code runs on a CPU, but you also know different types of CPUs. You know in-order CPUs, pipeline CPUs, and you know out-of-order CPUs. They execute the same code in different ways. Some of them are more efficient, some of us, others are less efficient. Or CMD code you can execute on a vector processor or an, on an array processor, or the multi-threaded code you can execute it on a multiprocessor or a multi-thread, multi-core processor. So the execution model from the programming model, and as I was saying in the, in the previous example, we can run a sequential code on an out-of-order processor, or we can run SPMD code uh, or MIMD code on a SIMD processor. And that's exactly what GPUs do, as we will see. So now that more or less the difference between programming model and execution model uh, should be clear, one of them, uh, programming model relates to the software, while the execution model relates to how this software executes on the hardware, we can, um, um, we can discuss different ways of exploiting the parallelism, the inherent parallelism that resides in this vector addition here. So remember that this is all sequential code. In a sequential machine, we will first execute iteration one, then we go to iteration two and so on. But there are different ways of exploiting the instruction level parallelism that we have here. We talk about instruction per level parallelism because some of these instructions or many of these instructions are independent of each other and they can execute in parallel. Like for example, this ad here is completely independent of this ad here. When we express the parallelism that this code has, we can start with a very simple, uh, very um, uh, easiest way, which is just writing sequential code in a CCD. Or we can directly write parallel code using vector instructions in a CIMD manner, or we can use multiple threads, like for example, open MP threads in order to express this um, code in a multi-threaded manner. So let's start with this, the, the first of the programming models, the sequential programming model. We know that a sequential program can be executed, for example, on a pipeline processor is a way of extracting, obtaining some instruction level parallelism or in an out of order processor where uh, the, the out of order processor automatically detects independent instructions and can launch them at the, at the I mean, in, in consecutive cycles onto the different um, uh, functional units and have the execution concurrently. Um, in some way, what the out of order processor is doing is unrolling the loop, right? Because if you have this iteration and then this iteration and you somehow can launch this load and this load almost at the same time and you can have concurrent accesses to memory, what you're doing is unrolling the loop by the hardware. And we can also uh, take advantage of uh, super scalar or very long, very long instruction word execution in order to take advantage of multiple uh, execution units that we may have in our system. So there are multiple ways of exploiting the instruction level parallelism in this sequential code. Another thing that we can do is writing data parallel code, like for example, in a CIMD manner, we already know that each iteration here is independent. So the programmer or the compiler can generate the um, CIMD code, uh, the CIMD instructions to take advantage of this uh, independence of the different iterations, right? The inherent parallelism that we have here. So these two loads and a few more of them until you know the maximum vector length that we have is a vector instruction. This will be a vector load. Here we have another vector load. Here we have a vector and finally a vector store. As you know, where this is best executed is in a CIMD processor like vector or array processors. Um, and, um, and yeah, that, that's something that we have seen uh, in the previous lecture. So now um, the third programming model is the multi-threaded programming model. 
In the multi-threaded programming model, the realization is the same. Each iteration is independent. So what I'm going to do is, instead of packing these different iterations, in vector arrays and vector instructions, what uh, we are going to do is that each of these iterations is going to be assigned to a thread of execution, right? So this is what we normally do in <clears throat> when we write code for MIMD machines. And this programming model is not only MIMD, but also called single program multiple data. <clears throat> because observe that in all these iterations, the program is essentially the same, but they are operating on different data instances. And the good thing, and here is where uh, um, we bring up GPUs, this SPMD code can be executed on a machine. You will see how we execute this on uh, CIMD engines. In the GPU context, in the GPU world, we talk not uh, about CIMD, we talk about CIMT because it's the same program and the same instructions for multiple threads of execution that are going to run together on the CIMD units. So, um, in summary, a GPU is a SIMD or SIMT. The main difference with a conventional SIMD processor is that we don't program it using SIMD instructions. We program it using threads, uh, following an SPMD programming model. Each thread executes the same code, the same program, but operates on a different piece of data. And because we are using threads, uh, each thread has its own context. Its, its, its thread in principle can have its own PC, can have its own registers and so on. So here is where the, let's say the, mm, uh, uh, mm, the advantage of using this programming model comes from the perspective we can uh, handle the different threads in a completely independent manner we just assume that they are going to run independently from others, even though that's not the true behind, that's not the true on the hardware, but that makes the life of the programmer and also um, the compiler easier um, because you don't really have to worry about packing uh, the uh, data elements in the right way on a vector register and, and write the code using the vector registers, which is uh, uh, quite more challenging. The thing is that what the hardware is going to do with these threads is that automatically or dynamically, this hardware is going to take these, these threads and is going to create groups of uh, or sets of threads that we call warps or wavefronts. And these are the, let's say, scene units that are execute, uh, executed uh, all together onto the hardware. We are going to take a closer look at this. So, a warp for an uh, easy definition is essentially a CMD operation formed by the hardware uh, dynamically and transparently to the programmer who only needs to worry about writing code for individual threads. So going again to the uh, slide of the parallelizable code, uh, it's a um, single program, multiple data uh, program, what we are going to use and this program is going to be executed by warps, which are sets of threads that execute the same instruction. So in some way, this warp is the CIMD unit and is the, um, the entity that is executing the CIMD instructions. So for example, here, these two loads are going to be part of the same CIMD instruction that is going to be executed by warp zero. This instruction is, for example, stored in PCX and then we have uh, the next uh, instruction for warp zero is uh, in PCX plus one, and uh, this addition TX plus two, and this store is uh, PCX plus three. And um, interestingly, here um, we and, and we will see we can interleave the execution of these instructions for warp zero with the execution of the same instructions for other warps. Because in our program, we will only have not a few threads that are, that are going to be executed as a single warp. 
we will have, we will end up having hundreds or thousands of warps as we will see. Okay, so graphics processing units uh, is simply not exposed to the program, it is a CMD execution model. In the conventional CMD, what we have is a sequential execution stream of CMD instructions. So in reality, we have a single thread and this thread land is a execution vector instructions or CMD instructions, like for example, these vector load, vector app, vector store, etc. cetera. And, and we have a vector length, which is the width or the length of our uh, CMD engines. And then uh, in the CMD model, CMD execution model, we have multiple instruction streams or of scalar instructions. And these multiple execution instruction streams are the different threads. The, the hardware uh, groups dynamically these threads into warp and executes um, uh, the warps uh, on the hardware. Uh, as, as you can expect, these warps have a certain length, right? Which is uh, corresponds to the vector length, but here we talk about a uh, number of threads that compose the warps. In NVIDIA architecture, this value is typically uh, 32. In other architectures, like for example, AMD, it's uh, 64 and uh, the term from is applied to, um, so corresponds to um, AMD GPUs while WARP is a uh, NVIDIA terminology. Uh, so there are um, two major advantages of CMT. The first one is that we can treat each thread separately. Recall that as a programmer, uh, as programmers, we only need to worry about writing code for each thread independently. And there is an additional advantage or at least potential advantage, which is the ability of, uh, of um, creating warps in a flexible and dynamic manner. We will first talk about the first advantage. We'll later talk about the um, second advantage. But before, before we continue, I would like to uh, take a break. Let's take a 10 minute break. I think that should be uh, fine. And from here, uh, we will continue uh, talking about uh, GPUs.
Okay, um, I think uh, we can continue now. Uh, Jan, Geraldo, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear. Well. Okay, okay. So then I think that we can uh, continue. We were um, here, this is slide where we are going to start talking about fine-grained multi-threading multi of warps. Um, I, I think I have to apologize because I just heard that there were some uh, audio problems uh, in the previous part of the lecture. I hope that uh, still uh, most of it uh, was understandable. Uh, you know that this uh, recording is going to be available uh, in YouTube, so hopefully uh, you will be able to understand it uh, even if you need to watch some uh, parts of the presentation uh, a couple of times. Um, and for sure, feel free to uh, reach me if you need to clarify anything after the lecture and also um, continue using Piazza as you are, as you are doing. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is where we are, fine green multi-threading of warps. We are now go, uh, going to talk about the ability of GPUs of executing warps and instructions for the warps uh, in a fine-grained multi-threaded uh, manner. Uh, we already know that GPUs are internally CIMD engines. Uh, we have uh, seen in the previous slides that we program these CIMD engines in a fle more flexible and simpler manner than the traditional way of uh, programming uh, CIMD engines, which is using vector instructions. Uh, we can use threads, we can use the single program, multiple data uh, programming model. And now we are going to see more in detail how the, uh, these threads, uh, when they are um, grouped into warps, are executed onto the hardware. So uh, first of all, uh, we know that, uh, or we assume from now on that a warp consists of 32 threads so for example, if you need to process, recall these uh, vector addition uh, code uh, that we are using as a running example throughout the previous lecture and this lecture, uh, imagine that this N is uh, 32K iterations, so, and, and we assign one iteration per thread, this means that we are going to need 1K warps, 1,024 warps. And uh, we, we, we probably don't have in our GPU seen the units to execute all these warps at the same time. So that's why uh, our CIMD units are going to be a uh, pipeline. And on this pipeline, we are going to execute these warps or the instructions from these warps in an interleaved manner. This is what we call the fine grain multi-threading of warps. So, um, recall our first instruction was, was the load, different loads from um, uh, array A in different iterations of the loop. Uh, we assign each of these iterations to a different thread. And then when these threads uh, go to the hardware or are executed on the hardware, they are grouped into a warp. And essentially this warp is representing one vector instruction that is stored uh, at a certain time. Uh, PC in the instruction memo, right? So um, the way that we launch the instructions for these warps is in an interleaved manner, as I uh, said before. We can um, interleave the execution of instructions coming from different warps. And here you have an example. Uh, at this uh, time in the execution, we launch or we issue uh, this load instruction for warp zero and then we may uh, issue this loading, the same load instruction for warp one, and then maybe this uh, add instruction for a completely different warp, warp 20 in this case. The way that um, we are able to do this onto the CIMD pipeline is by using a scheduler. This a scheduler is uh, responsible for taking each warp and deciding what instruction from which warp is going to run onto the <clears throat> CMD pipeline at a certain time. Let's start taking a closer look at this CMD pipeline of GPUs. This is um, yeah, a pictorial representation of a, a CMD pipeline. And as you can see uh, on the top, what we see are like the architectural registers like a PC um, and uh, and mask, because recall, this is CIMD execution. So we are also going to have a mask 
uh, to handle things like branch divergence, as we will see in a few slides. And we have many of these, several of these, well, in particular in, in current GPUs, for example, we have um, uh, 64 of these, if I recall correctly. So each of these corresponds to one warp. So this PC will be pointing to the particular instruction, next instruction that we are going to execute for warp zero, for warp one, and so on. And when the scheduler decides to execute an instruction for a particular warp, we will have to go to the instruction cache, read the instruction, decode it, and then launch issue it onto the CMD execution that, as you can see, is composed by several of these scalar pipelines that are what we have called CMD lanes in uh, some previous slides. There are uh, a few of these uh, cores, CMD cores. We typically call them shader cores or also GPU cores inside the whole GPU. And uh, these different shader or GPU cores can access memory through an interconnection memory and the corresponding uh, and different memory controllers. So as uh, we said, uh, uh, instructions from different warps are executed in a fine-grained multi-thread manner onto the uh, pipeline. You have a little bit more detailed pipeline here the instruction fetch, decode, then we go to the register file for each of these lanes. We have the corresponding part of the uh, register file, the part that corresponds to the thread that is going to run um, on this lane. And then uh, ALUs, and at some point we will also have to access data from memory. We have a data cache, we actually have two types of caches inside each of the um, <clears throat> GPU cores. One of the cache is like a conventional cache similar to the ones that we are going to see in later um, lectures that is handled automatically by the uh, hardware in a completely transparent manner um, with respect to the programmer. The other part of the cache is what is called a scratch pad, a scratch pad. And this is also called by kind of software uh, cache, which means that the programmer himself or herself can decide what's going to be written into this cache for faster access. Uh, because when we have uh, caches in the pipeline, this means that their access is much faster than going to the uh, large DRAM memory that we have outside of the, uh, of, of the chip. Um, uh, but yeah, so this is where the problem comes, right? Sometimes we won't find the data inside the cache, so we have to go to this uh, GPU memory uh, or GPU DRAM memory, which is typically called global memory uh, in the uh, uh, GPU programming model. Uh, the problem with uh, uh, going to the uh, global memory is that this takes even hundreds of cycles, right? But um, the way that we have to, act to hide these um, uh, high latencies of accessing data that resides in the global memory is by taking advantage of the fine-grained multi-threading execution. So while, for example, there is a miss in this cache, so we have to go to the global memory for warp one or warp two or warp C, uh, six, we can uh, use uh, the pipeline in the meantime to execute instructions from other warps that are not stalled because they don't need to go to the global memory yet. So this is what we call the ability to um, hide the, um, the latency, the long latency operations or, or the latency tolerance. And this uh, typically works well for the type of applications that uh, we are going to execute, typically uh, regular, massively parallel um, um, programs that we are going to execute onto the uh, GPU hardware. Like for example, when we are processing images, images are composed by thousands or millions of pixels. And some of these pixels will be assigned to different, or these pixels will be assigned to different warps. And when we start executing operations for these warps, if uh, it turns out that for a particular warp, let's say warp zero, we have to go to the global memory and bring some data, we can execute uh, instructions uh, in the pipeline uh, for these pixels using other warps. Okay, recall also this slide, how the um, um, warp execution happens inside the uh, CIMD, um unit, inside the GPU core. 
um, in a similar way as we have seen in CIMDI processors, depending on what's the number of lanes that we have inside the GPU core, we will be able to exploit more or less concurrency, more or less parallelism here. Um, and again, uh, you have just seen a GPU core, and essentially a GPU core is the same thing that you have here. It's composed by CIMD functional units, and each of these uh, is divided into multiple lanes, uh, and um, these lanes have different execution units that can read operands from uh, registers. In this case, these are not vector registers. Here we talk about the registers that correspond to a particular thread and each thread is identified by an ID. For example, here we have the registers from uh, for register the for thread zero, four, eight, and so on. And also, uh, you know, this um, uh, slide as well, we were using it to explain the execution of vector instructions on a CIMD pipeline with a, um, um, a number of lanes that is smaller than the vector length. Here, we do exactly the same for the warps. Now our, our uh, vector length is the warp size, which is 32 threads. And uh, in this particular example, we consider that inside each of the GPU cores, we only have eight lanes. So if we want to execute the 32 threads of the warp, we will need four cycles to issue this load in, uh, instruction or this multiply instruction or this addition instruction. But in the end, it's exactly the same idea. And if you think about this, there is even uh, some sort of rigidness here. Why is that? Because warps are only 32 uh, threads, right? We cannot change the warp size. It might uh, turn out that for some particular problem, I may want to use <clears throat> more than 32 uh, threads per warp. Because for example, I want them to um, uh, run together and at some point uh, communicate because they are executing together. If we want to do that, uh, we can do it. And actually the programming model allows us to do so. Um, imagine this example here, uh, we have, uh, let, let's think that we have uh, warps, not 32, but for this simple example is warps of four threads. So if we want to uh, process these uh, 16 data elements that we have here, we are, assign we are assigning one of these data elements to one individual thread. And then when these threads go to execute onto the hardware, they will be grouped into four warps of four threads each, and then they are executed. Um, the thing is, uh, at some point, I may want these four threads run more or less together and more or less at the same time for the specific needs of my program. And this is always four in this example or 32 in, 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 in real world GPUs. So what the programming does is hiding the concept of warps to the programmer. These warps are not really exposed to the GPU programmers. However, what the programming model exposes is some similar organization that is called the block in the uh, CUDA programming model, or it's called the waveform in the OpenCL programming model. And uh, from the programming perspective, what we do is um, grouping the whole bunch of threads that we want to run on the GPU into different blocks of threads. And the good thing here is that the size of the block is something tunable. We can, uh, we, the programmers can decide whether we want to use blocks of 100 threads or blocks of 200 th threads. Actually, it's, uh, it's very typical that the size of the blocks is a multiple of 32 because as you can guess now, when these blocks go to the hardware, will be decomposed into multiple warps of 32 threads. Uh, how do we execute a program on the GPU? We will typically have, recall Amdahl's law, uh, sequential or serial parts in our code, and we will have massively parallel parts in our code. So, um, the serial parts are going to run on the CPU that we call the host CPU. The parallel parts are going to run on the uh, parallel device, which is the GPU. This is like a uh, typical CUDA syntax when we want to launch a kernel or a function, the function that we execute on the GPU is called the kernel. And, uh, and here in this syntax we define, in this call we define the number of blocks that we want to launch and the number of threads per block. And then we will have the, the, the kernel will, will finish, this computation finishes on the GPU, and then we have some more serial code, and then uh, we may launch another kernel, for example, kernel B. 
Um, very, very quickly, even though this is not the uh, main topic of this <clears throat> particular lecture, uh, we want to uh, take a very quick look at how do we need to write a code, in particular, this is CUDA code for NVIDIA GPUs um, to uh, express um, in a in SPMD manner, in a multi-threaded manner, this uh, sequential code or uh, vector addition. Uh, so notice that this is the <clears throat> definition of the kernel. The kernel name is a kernel function. And here inside the kernel, we are using a thread ID. The way that we calculate this thread ID is by taking into consideration the thread ID inside each block, the uh, block ID among all the blocks that we are launching on the GPU and the block dimension. This way we calculate this ID. We are essentially assigning one element of A and one element of B to each thread. We load these elements from memory into some temporary variables. We add these temporary variables and store the result in C. And here you have more or less the uh, same code. Now it's a little bit more complex because we are doing some bound checking in this case. This M, this N, for example, may not be a multiple of the block size. Maybe this N is uh, 1,000 and, and we are launching here of uh, 32 blocks of 32 threads, right? So in total, we have 1,024 threads and that's why we need to do this bound checking. So again, we calculate um, the um, uh, indices, a thread ID. In this case, we are using blocks of two dimensions. And, uh, and here you, you see how we call uh, the expression to call the kernel from the CPU code. This is CPU code. This is GPU code inside the same um, uh, parallel. Uh, program with also some serial parts, of course, as you can see. So if you want to learn more about uh, GPU programming, you can watch this uh, lecture. It's uh, completely optional. We will um, uh, link it from the course website, and it's uh, about it's an introduction uh, to GPU programming from a previous um, edition of this course. Okay, how do we program GPUs? We use blocks, but obviously, uh, the hardware itself doesn't really understand blocks. The hardware understands the warps. So what we need to uh, uh, explain now is how we convert these blocks into warps. And this is actually pretty simple. Essentially, when we launch a kernel uh, using a certain number of blocks of a certain number of threads onto a GPU, the first thing that the GPU does is taking each of these blocks and dividing them into uh, warps of 32 threads. And now when they run, when instructions run on the uh, GPU core, here you have an example uh, GPU core from the Fermi architecture from 2010. When these uh, warps of thread uh, threads run on this GPU core, they run uh, individually uh, from each other. So when we launch an instruction, it's an instruction for one warp, that belongs from the software side or from the software perspective to a certain block. So as you see, from the programmer's perspective, you, we don't need to understand what's a warp. Um, we can use blocks. The size of these blocks is flexible. It's the hardware, uh, the responsible one for uh, mm, dividing the blocks uh, into warps and executing the instructions for these warps. Of course, if you uh, really want to be a good programmer and write optimized code, you will have to understand what you have uh, inside the GPU, right? So uh, being conscious of the um, uh, concept of the warp and the way that warps are executed onto the uh, CIMD or GPU pipeline, um, it's important to get the most from all programs in, when executing on the GPU. Uh, let's very quickly take a closer look at this uh, streaming multiprocessor. This is NVIDIA terminology or um, uh, GPU core. Inside the GPU core, we have an instruction cache. In this case, we have two warp schedulers, which means that each of these can um, uh, check what are the available warps that can execute instructions because their operands are ready and uh, launches or dispatches uh, the instructions on these uh, seem the functional units. In particular, you see uh, 16 of these SPs, which are just uh, uh, vector lanes. So we have 16 here, another 16 here, and these, uh, we also have some more that are, let's say, more specialized. For example, these are uh, for load and store operations, and these SFU, meaning uh, special function units, are execution units for 
um, some more specialized operations, like for example, um, uh, trigonometric functions like co sine, cosine, and so on. As you can see, we also have the register file. We need to read the operands from there. And we also have some on-chip caches, a constant cache to store uh, constant values. And this space here, I mentioned it, it before, is like the whole cache that can be divided into a, let's say, hardware-managed cache and a software-managed cache or scratchpad memory, which is called this uh, shared memory on, uh, in NVIDIA GPUs. Okay, so uh, let's recap on uh, warp-based SIMD and compare it to traditional SIMD. In traditional SIMD, recall we have a single thread. This thread executes uh, sequentially, but it can execute uh, SIMD instructions. These SIMD instructions operate in lockstep. We say lockstep because they, uh, so it's like whole SIMD instruction and then the next SIMD instruction and then the next SIMD instruction for all the vector lanes at the same time. The SIMD programming model is uh, SIMD. We are not using extra threads. There is a single thread using SIMD instructions. And uh, while in the WAR-based SIMD, we are using multiple scalar threads. As I said before, it's easier. From the pro programmer's perspective, we don't have to worry about the lock lockstep execution. We don't have to worry about packing different operands in the uh, right way in using vector registers. The hardware is going to do that for that for us. The programming model is not SIMD, SIMD <clears throat> and we uh, can play with the uh, vector length in some way because we can uh, define what's the length of the of the thread blocks, right? Or work groups in in OpenCL. Um, this enables to decompose these blo uh, blocks into uh, groups of threads, which are the warps, and then executed in a multi-threaded manner. The ISA is a scalar in this case, it, the, we are not using vector instructions. And essentially what we are doing is implementing the, SIMD pro, the SPMD programming model on SIMD hardware. Recall that SPMD is a, a programming model, it's not a computer organization, means, it, uh, it means a single procedure or program multiple data. And we have multiple processing, uh, processing elements executing the same procedure, except operating on different data, data elements. At some point, we may want these different threads to synchronize, right? But because not in all cases, we will have such a regular computation as for example, in the vector addition where we can have thread zero working only on element zero of A, element zero of B and element zero of C, and then thread one working on element one and uh, of A, B and C and so on. They are completely uh, independent. Um, um, but in some other cases, we may want to synchronize. Let, in, let me um, give you a very simple example of when we need a synchronization. Imagine that what we want to compute in parallel is the reduction of a whole array. The, redu the reduction means the uh, the whole sum of all the elements in the array. If you have a sequential machine, you have a, a conventional CPU, what you're gonna do is just reading element zero, accumulate, reading element one, accumulate, element two, accumulate, and so on. And in the end, we will have the sum of all these elements, right? But you can see here that there is a lot of parallelism, especially because in the uh, reduction and with, when we use in addition, we can take advantage of the um, commutative and associative property properties of addition. So one thing that we could distribute, uh, we would do is distributing the whole array into multiple threads. Let's imagine for the simplest case that we have threads, thread zero and thread one. And thread zero is going to reduce to sum all the elements of the first half of the array, thread one, the remaining elements. At some point in the beginning, they can operate independently, right? Uh, they just, so thread zero goes and adds element zero, one, two, three, until the uh, um, half of the array and, and thread one does the same. They can work independently, but at some point we need them to synchronize. Why is that? Because we need to, for example, thread one, communicate the partial result to thread zero and then thread zero add the two partial values and obtain the final result. So if uh, and now imagine that we are not talking about two threads, we are talking about two warps. So these warp, warps are uh, executing in an interleaf manner. And at some point we want to make sure that they both have finished with the partial sums. So in order to do so, we use a barrier. And this is uh, like a, um, 
synchronization command or synchronization instruction that we use at some point in our program and warps will wait there until other warps reach to that point. So that's something that also the SPMD programming model uh, offers and the hardware will handle it uh, transparently. So um, essentially we have here multiple instruction streams executing on the same program. Uh, each program or each thread is uh, working on different data and they can even execute different control paths, right? Because same thing, say, uh, in, in, in the same way that we can um, have these threads operating on different data and at some point, for example, synchronizing, they can also execute, for example, if else statements and maybe thread zero goes to uh, the if path, path while uh, thread one goes uh, through the else path, right? So this is also something that the um, hardware will handle, will handle by itself. And this is a behavior that we can find in many scientific applications. And that's why, um, because we can take advantage of the GPUs in this way, that's why GPUs are also so popular these days for many different types of applications, not only regular computations, like for example, what we need for a matrix multiplication or uh, for machine learning and neural networks, but also uh, more complex uh, programs that require uh, more synchronization across different threads, like for example, graph processing. Okay, um, again, uh, CIMD, you, you, I think you already know this slide, uh, CIMD is a sequential instruction stream executing CIMD instructions. Uh, CIMD is multiple instruction streams of the scalar instructions. We know already that uh, each thread can be treated separately as a programmer. I only need to worry about writing code for one thread and then I know that I have multiple threads running in parallel or uh, supposedly in parallel. Um, then the hardware handles everything by using the warps and interleaving the execution of warps. Now let's also see uh, what additional features we could have uh, in GPUs, uh, the ability of uh, grouping uh, warps or grouping um, uh, threads into warps flexibly, flexibly in order to maximize the uh, efficiency and the utilization of the CIMD units and, and maximize the performance. But very um, before uh, going to these um, ideas or to these proposals, let me very briefly discuss how we need to execute, as I said, uh, the, the, the example that I just gave, right? We have um, different threads and some of the threads go through the else and uh, through the if um, path and some others go through the else path. path. So here you have even a more complex example with uh, different conditions that are evaluated, uh, some threads, will go, for example, thread one goes through code A, B, C, D, uh, E, and G, and then uh, thread two goes through this path, and thread three as well, and then thread four goes to the, this path. And these are four consecutive threads, so it's very likely they are going to be grouped together in the same warp and executed at the same time. How can the hardware handle this? How can the, har um, the hardware handle the fact that each of these threads needs to go through a different path, um, different control flow path. Uh, we are going to start with a, a simpler example. In this case, uh, we consider like the if else example, we have path A, for example, if path B, for example, the else path. And uh, how do we handle this divergence? Observe that um, when we start the execution, all threads in the warp are executing together, they go to the branch, um, they evaluate the branch condition, and then some of them will have to go through path A, some others to through path B. So that's actually what we do, right? Um, these uh, particular threads, for example, this is thread zero, two, three, and seven, execute path A, the remaining threads execute path B. We can handle this for sure. And uh, I think we are going to see it in the next slide. We can handle it using mask execution in the same way as we use masks in CIMD processors. It's a hardware mask. Um, but there is a problem here. The problem is that, as you can see, the two paths are executed independently. And we need to repeat, let's say, the execution for all the threads, even though only some of them are active through the whole path A and then through the whole path B. So even though it's possible to execute this divergent branch onto the GPU, it's not the most efficient thing, right? 
Um, so that's why we usually try to find ways either in software or in hardware to optimize our codes uh, and optimize our hardware in a way that we can save some of these cycles. We will see some examples. Um, yeah, this is like, um, yeah, exactly what, what I said before is like what we call in the in SIMD processors conditional predicated or mask execution. And you have seen already in the previous uh, uh, lecture, what's a vector mask or what are the uh, mask vector operations. Now let's talk about how we can potentially optimize uh, the execution of these warps that are that have divergence. Let's say we, we talk about intra warp divergence. Uh, let's see some uh, a couple of proposals uh, as a way to optimize the, the execution of uh, GPU programs onto the um, hardware. Um, we assume that we have uh, many threads, and we know that we can um, um, we can treat we, uh, when we are programmed the code. We can treat threads in an independent manner. Some of them will be at the same PC; and they will uh, be in the same warp. And at some point, we are going to be able to create uh, warps dynamically, as we will see uh, in the next slide. This is a way of reducing the divergence and improving an important uh, metric, which is the SIMD utilization. We call SIMD utilization the fraction of SIMD lanes executing a useful operation. So if we go back to this example, we see that here the SIMD utilization is 100% because all threads are active. But here, SIMD utilization is only 50% because only half of the threads are active in this uh, particular path, right? So uh, in the end, what we want to do is maximize, maximizing this uh, SIMD utilization because this is the way of improving the performance uh, of our programs uh, on the GPU. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at a possible way of doing this uh, dynamic uh, warp formation. Um, we start with uh, a yeah, very simple example. We have two warps. Uh, they are uh, executing if else statement. Uh, some of the warps, uh, some of the threads of the warp go through the uh, else, some others go through the if, and here the same for another warp. The good thing is that it turns out that even though these are two different warps that are launched at different cycles, in principle, they are going to be launched at different cycles. Uh, uh, the good thing is that this warp I, Y is only uh, using lanes that are not occupied by threads in the other warp. So the idea here, the key idea here is to merge these two warps and create a single warp Z uh, from threads coming from different warps. Uh, uh, originally, we launched the instructions for this one warp th uh, Z at the same time, and we are increasing the SIMD utilization here. In some other cases, we can find I don't know, something like this, where there are two threads that are overlapping because they are in the same lane. So in this case, we cannot merge or we cannot merge all of them. Uh, but for example, then if we have a, a third warp, for example, here, and we can also uh, merge a little, a little bit more and, and um, where we had three instructions from three different warps, now we have two. So by increasing the SIMD utilization. Um, and let's take a, a look at the same example as we saw before. When we go to the uh, branch, we evaluate this branch. Some of the uh, threads go through path A, some others through path B. And then for another warp, this uh, orange or pink that uh, just uh, showed up, um, uh, we also execute the branch operation. Um, some of the threads go through path A, some others through path B. And here we can merge, as you can see, and create a single warp that contains threads coming from originally coming from different warps. And, and, and yeah, this is just like a kind of timeline where you can see a more complex example uh, with uh, different uh, paths of execution, different uh, blocks of code, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and different threads are going to be following different paths. In the baseline, um, we see some uh, divergence at some point, for example, here uh, in path B, some of them go through uh, C, some others go through D, and so on. This takes some time. 
when we do the dynamic warp formation, we create new warps from new warps from scalar threads from other warps. And uh, and, and for example, uh, here uh, for this uh, block of code C, we can merge these two and create a single warp from two threads coming from two different warps. Then for, for D, E, and so on. And in the end, uh, we end up having more efficient execution and faster, which is a actual goal. Okay, we are going to see another example here. It's, um, uh, but uh, we will, uh, so first, uh, so before going to the next example of hardware optimization that we can apply on GPU cores, uh, let's uh, very quickly recap on what we have uh, inside each of the, the GPU cores. The GPU core is composed by CIMD functional units, each of them with a certain number of uh, ALUs or processing elements. Uh, we group these uh, ALUs or these functional uh, processing elements into what we call lanes. And on these lanes, we are going to have different threads from different warps running in different cycles, right? In a pipeline manner. Um, the operands are read from uh, the register file. It's a partition register file where um, some of the registers are assigned to some of the threads and so on. We have seen in the previous slide that uh, one good thing is that if we have, for example, thread zero from warp zero that is going to run here and thread one for, from warp, warp one that is going to run here, and uh, and and you know they 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 the whole warps are not you know hundred percent utilized. We can merge these uh, right, and and we can have faster execution because we can dynamically or at least uh, potentially can dynamically create uh, new warps that are have a higher utilization and are more efficient in the end. However, uh, we have seen that there are cases where uh, two threads from different warps have to go to the same lane and then somehow they overlap. So we cannot do this merging, right? Why can't we do this merging? Um, there is yeah, one example here right? for this uh, piece of code B, this blue thread and this red thread overlap. So we cannot merge the two warps completely. Why is that? Why, why do we have this problem? And it's because we cannot so easily move one thread from here to another lane. So in, in principle, inside the GPU uh, core, the threads are statically assigned to the lanes. So it's not that easy, it's not that easy to move the threads flexibly uh, across lanes. Could it be possible? Yeah, it may be possible. You may uh, come up with your, with your own ideas to make it possible. Like for example, saving that these registers for thread zero, for example, in some temporary storage and then copying them um, into this part of the partition register file. And this way we are somehow shifting uh, the uh, thread zero from this lane to another lane. And maybe this is a way of uh, creating more um, uh, efficiently utilized uh, warps. I don't know. This is kind of uh, food, uh, food for thought for you. Okay, now let's uh, take a look at, at another example of how to um, optimize the GPU hardware. This is a paper from our group uh, from uh, Micro 2011. And here we are going to talk about the relatively easy, uh, simple and easy to understand, but very efficient solutions for two of the main problems for GPU and their utilization. One of them is branch divergence. We have just seen it. We may have intra-warp divergence, and this makes that uh, we cannot fully utilize the warps in our program. The other big issue uh, inside the GPU are the long latency operations. For example, going frequently uh, to the global memory, which is uh, far away, hundreds, let's say 200, 300 uh, of cycles away uh, to bring new data and net data and bring it uh, to the um, caches inside the GPU core. So we are going to see two ways. Uh, <clears throat> we have talked about branch divergence just now. So you must understand uh, what the issue here is in order for you to see um, 
clear example of uh, why long latency operations are also a problem. Imagine that we have uh, all warps uh, computing over time. They are executing instructions in the pipeline um, here inside these blocks that says all warps compute. We will have uh, instruction zero for warp zero, instruction zero for warp one, and so on, maybe hundreds of instructions here. But at some point, all these warps that are, have been executed in a round robin manner, the scheduler just goes, takes one new instruction for one warp, executes on the pipeline, then takes another instruction and so on. At some point, all these warps need to go to memory to read more data to continue uh, the processing, right? So the problem is that at some point, they all will stall in the, GP, in the GPU pipeline, in the GPU uh, core, and they all uh, will have to go to memory for uh, many cycles until they uh, bring the data and this way they can uh, continue uh, the execution in the pipeline. Okay, so let's uh, first talk about how to deal with branch divergence. The key idea here is kind of similar to the idea of the dynamic warp formation that we have seen in the uh, previous example. Um, the main difference here is that instead of merging uh, two different warps of uh, 32 threads, as we did in the previous case, uh, here what we uh, are doing is proposing the usage of larger warps, like for example, warps composed by 128 threads in instead of 32. So when they go to the decode stage, this large warp goes to the decode stage, um, we may have some of the threads going through if, some other threads going through else, and we may have, in principle, divergence, right? But uh, the, the idea of using large warps allows us to create smaller sub warps that are going to be uh, merge and execute it all together. So uh, imagine that yeah, in this particular example, I think um, <clears throat> that here um, uh, we have like uh, 24, uh, imagine in this uh, um, toy example uh, or the large warp has uh, 24 or uh, 32 uh, threads, uh, but in reality, the number of lanes that we have uh, in the GPU core is four. So what we do is we take three, four of these threads that we know that are going to be active on the current path and we put them together creating a sub warp and then we launch this sub warp for execution onto the uh, GPU pipeline, the, the, the GPU core. And then for uh, the next sub warp, in this case, we only have three active threads, but uh, again, uh, we are increasing the utilization much more than what uh, we would have had if we had just uh, executed the sub warps like um, threads, uh, the four threads that belong to the same row in this in this figure. So that would be, as you see, uh, the key idea is quite similar to the idea of the dynamic uh, warp formation. Formation. It's another way of implementing it. And now that let's take a look at the uh, 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 how to mitigate long latency operations. Recall from the uh, um, two slides ago that the problem is the fact that we have to go to uh, the global memory. This takes a long latency. At some point, all warps need to go, need to, go to the uh, global memory in order for them to be able to continue uh, computing. Here, the idea is to perform what is called a two-level roaming scheduling, where we divide the warps into groups of warps and uh, we schedule in a way that we first schedule all warps from one group, then we schedule all warps from another group. And this way, as soon as all these warps from group zero reach this point where we, they need to go to the uh, global memory, um, we can continue executing instructions from warps belonging to group one and this way we achieve more overlap. As you can see here, we are hiding the latency, this latency of the access to the global memory with the execution uh, of, uh, of warps on the GPU pipeline. And then we continue uh, with the memory access for warps in group two. And then we can also have some more overlap, uh, this compute with this uh, access to memory. So this is, uh, as I said, um, I would, recommend you to read this paper if you are interested in this kind of techniques. Another way of uh, continue, you know, improving 
uh, the GPU hardware and make it more efficient to increase uh, what is called the CIMD utilization. Okay, uh, so we are almost done with today's lecture. Um, now, this is more or less uh, optional material. Uh, you don't need to watch it now. You can watch it later if you're interested. We are going to talk about uh, the evolution of uh, GPUs, in particular, uh, a couple of uh, free NVIDIA GPUs. And, uh, and we are going to learn a little bit more about some of the execution units that these uh, GPUs have inside. Um, the very first example is this uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 285. Uh, this is a GPU that was uh, launched in 2009, and it's actually like a relatively advanced uh, in its uh, family of uh, GPUs. The first ones uh, with this architecture were released uh, one or one and a half years uh, earlier. And, uh, and by that time, this uh, GTX 285 was uh, really powerful, including uh, 240 stream processors. This is uh, NVIDIA terminology. In the generic speak, we can talk about 30 GPU cores or 30 shader, shader cores, as, as we also uh, uh, refer to them. And each of these cores contains eight uh, CIMD functional units, eight lanes inside each of the GPU cores. Uh, we can take a, a look inside each of these uh, cores. So this gray thing here is a, a whole core. Inside the core, we have the CIMD functional units. You can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, until eight. And inside each of the functional units, so these are the lanes, what we have called lanes over the uh, course of the lecture, we have also uh, several execution units, like for example, execution units for multiplication or execution units for multiplication and addition um, in, a, in a single cycle. And then there are like uh, more components here, like instruction stream decode is like the decode unit, and then some execution content context, which is like PC, mask, uh, registers, etc. Um, you, you already know these uh, details, uh, groups of 32 threads are a warp, and we can have up to 32 warps. Uh, by that time, we would have up to 32 warps running uh, concurrently on each of these uh, GTX uh, uh, 285 cores. Uh, so up to uh, 1,024 threads or 32 warps of 32 threads. And this is a view of the whole GPU with its uh, 30 cores and up to well, more than 30,000 threads, as you can see. But uh, obviously since 2009, GPUs have evolved a lot. It's been like 12 years. And in 12 years, you can see how the number of functional units or stream processors has increased from how many? 240 in the GTX uh, 285 up to, uh, we are talking about several thousands. I think it's more than 6,000. Um, in the most recent A100 that was launched last year. Um, not only the number of functional units has increased, also the computing performance that uh, these have uh, in gigafollops has increased, as you can see, at a very uh, similar pace. And they are not only much faster, but also they are more energy efficient because many of the innovation that have the innovations that have been uh, applied onto the hardware over these years uh, have had the goal of um, uh, increasing the energy efficiency of these uh, processors. This is another example. This one is from 2017. It's like, let's say like the previous uh, penultimate <laughs> generation um, is a Volta V100. Um, it has uh, 5,120 5, uh, of these stream processors. Um, in generic speak, this is uh, 80 cores, 80 GPU cores, and 64 uh, units inside each core. I, uh, we have it here because one interesting thing of this GPU is that it includes a new type of cores that are called the tensor cores and are specialized for machine learning. We are going to uh, briefly talk about them. But uh, first, let's take a look at the block diagram of the whole GPU, as you can see, 80 cores uh, on the V100. One core is uh, each of these that you can see here. They are labeled as uh, SM. 
Um, and they all have access to a relatively large uh, L2 cache, the size of uh, memory, large uh, cache memory inside the, um, um, inside the GPU uh, die. Um, this size of the cache, I, if I recall correctly, is about uh, six megabytes. And then uh, the cores can access the external memory, which is the global memory, DRAM typically, uh, in this case is HBM2 memory, which is a, um, a special DRAM that is uh, built by using different layers of DRAM uh, and, and connected uh, in a special way using a lot of uh, lines uh, um, um, from the uh, stack of memory uh, to the GPU, GPU in this case. And this way we can extract much more bandwidth. You will talk about, uh, you will learn about uh, memories in, in later lectures. Now let's take a quick look at the uh, V100 uh, SM or GPU core. As you can see, it's uh, divided into kind of uh, four main parts in each, it's like a small GPU core inside a larger GPU core, right? Uh, so each of these parts contains its own warp scheduler to select the instruction from the warp that is going to be issued onto the pipeline next. We have this dispatch unit, we have the register file, and then we have these different execution units specialized for floating point uh, 64 operations, so uh, what, what we call the double data type, uh, integer, uh, float data type, and also we have these uh, tensor cores that are the cores that I mentioned before, specialized for machine learning or deep learning. Um, because the main operation in machine learning is multiply, accumulate, and as you know, and Professor Mudlu explained in the systolic array lecture, it's possible to transform um, a convolution, for example, convolutional layer into a matrix multiplication. Um, what the innovation here is to include in the core this type of um, smaller uh, functional units that can execute this matrix multiplication in a very uh, fast manner. So what they essentially do is taking two operands represented in uh, floating point 16 bits, they perform a, uh, a multiplication and, <coughs> and then they accumulate uh, using another uh, with um, some value coming from uh, the accumulator and they store again the result in the accumulator. Uh, and this is a way of, you know, doing so divide. So what we can do using these uh, tensor cores is dividing the whole matrix multiplication into a small tiles, and some each of these tiles are assigned to different tensor cores. And this way we can do this uh, matrix multiplication much faster. We can even take a look at what we have inside the tensor cores. This is kind of a model that has been proposed by uh, this paper from two years ago. In reality, we are not 100% sure that this is the way that the tensor core is built internally. But the authors of this paper, what they did was doing a lot of uh, micro benchmarking and reverse engineering in order to understand how these uh, tensor cores work and propose a possible microarchitecture for these tensor cores. Um, what we know from this paper is that each warp uh, utilizes uh, two tensor cores every time that uh, we need to execute instructions for one warp on the tensor cores, and each tensor core is divided into two octets. And now if we uh, take a closer look at each octet, we see that uh, it also has a like kind of uh, two thread groups, and each, in each thread group there are Cindy uh, execution units. In particular, uh, one CMD execution unit is what you can see here that performs a dot product operation. Several operands are uh, fed here. Uh, then we have uh, multipliers, then we have kind of uh, uh, parallel tree reduction, um, and, and we obtain some value that is stored in the accumulator. So um, with um, these uh, tensor cores, we can perform a four by four matrix multiply accumulate in one cycle per tensor core. So uh, this is why they are um, so fast at uh, executing matrix multiplication and uh, consequently machine learning workloads. Um, there is something uh, interesting here as well, because even though you can see this is kind of a 
SIMD unit as well. It's kind of a specialized SIMD unit that we, are, we also have inside the uh, each GPU core. But there is uh, some uh, interesting thing that makes it different from the conventional SIMD units and even from the other SIMD units in the, in the GPU core. And it's the fact that uh, now for these SIMD units, it's possible for some of the threads, for example, here we have uh, lanes uh, zero to three, it's possible for them to access data that is stored in registers from uh, other threads. And this is uh, relatively special, as you can see. So the register contents are not anymore private to each individual thread, but now they are shared inside the work um, when it comes to the execution uh, on the tensor cores. And now we have the latest NVIDIA GPU here is the A100. It has even more of these stream processors in total 108 cores with 64 units inside. The tensor cores are also there. They are now a little bit optimized. They even have support for uh, sparse matrices as we will see. And uh, they also incorporate a new uh, data type uh, that is called uh, tensor floating 32, I think. Um, it's a data type optimized for uh, machine learning and neural net network training. And this is the, the uh, overall view of the whole GPU. It's very similar, as you can see, to the V100. Uh, the main difference is that it has uh, more cores. It can potentially have up, up to 128 cores. Another key difference is that the size of this L2 cache, now it's much larger. In the previous generation, it was like six or eight megabytes. Now we're talking about 40 megabytes. As you can imagine, this um, can be really beneficial for many, many uh, workloads that can really take advantage of this uh, larger cache. And now we also have uh, the external access to the HVM2 stacks as well. And if we uh, take a look at the tensor cores in this A100, uh, what we see is that, uh, well, they have this support for um, um, a sparse uh, matrix uh, uh, operations. Um, in, in, it turns out that in, in neural networks, many times we have uh, the weights that we use in each of the layers of the neural networks, but sometimes after training, some of these weights are zero or they are almost zero. So what it means is that when we are doing inference, we don't really need to, uh, it doesn't really make sense to perform multiplications uh, by those uh, zero elements, right? Because we know already that the result will be zero. So what uh, the tensor course now can do is uh, compressing uh, these weights in a way that we are going to save a lot of uh, space. And also we are going to be more efficient uh, in the execution in this part session the tensor core because we are not using the tensor cores to multiply uh, something by zero, which is uh, completely unproductive. So this is uh, essentially the uh, key idea here. Okay, so we are almost done. I hope that you uh, have enjoyed the lecture. I hope that you have learned um, uh, how uh, CMD processors work, how GPU works, how we program GPUs, the main difference between the key differences between the um, um, SPMD programming model and the execution model, SPMD as an example of a programming model. Um, just uh, a final slide, uh, some food for thought. Um, you have seen that GPUs are highly optimized processors. They are especially optimized these days for execution of machine learning workloads, neural networks, and so on. And we also know that another type of processors that are also specialized in this type of workloads are systolic arrays, like for example, TPUs that uh, Professor Mudlu explained in the systolic arrays lecture. Uh, is it possible to get the most of both worlds and combine them? Um, it's, it's something for you to think about. It would it be possible to maybe embed small uh, stolic arrays inside the GPU or maybe uh, make the systolic arrays more general purpose to have, let's say, more flexibility when it comes to executing other uh, types of workloads different from um, uh, matrix multiplication or, or this kind of regular computation. This is something that uh, you can think by yourself uh, and also try to answer these questions. Uh, we are already discussing about them, which one is better for machine learning or for image video processing. What type of parallelism each one exploits, right? So on the one side, we have GPUs with uh, CIMD 
uh, execution units and using also multi-threaded ex execution. On the other side, we have TPUs that are uh, systolic arrays. What are the trade-offs of each one and so on? So if you are uh, curious about these, uh, the answer to these questions or potential answers to these questions, uh, I would really encourage you to take uh, other courses from Professor Mudlu, like for example, the bachelor seminars in computer architecture, where we discuss uh, different papers from computer architecture, relevant, very important papers, uh, some of them more recent, some of them um, even decades old. Um, we discuss them and, um, and it's a way of uh, approaching to uh, important topics in computer architecture. And of course, you can also take the computer architecture master's course that Professor Mudlu gives uh, every uh, semester, every fall semester. Okay, and I think that this is all from my side. Uh, it took like seven more minutes, but as you know, the last part of the presentation is uh, uh, completely optional. Um, I think, I hope that most of the uh, questions uh, that you have uh, asked on the chat have been uh, solved by other TAs. Um, we will uh, review all these questions and as you know, uh, we, and we normally do, we, we will post them in Piazza for your reference. If you have uh, specific questions or ideas that you would like to discuss about uh, uh, GPUs, please, please uh, contact me, contact uh, Professor Mudlu or other TAs, and we'll, we will be uh, glad to um, discuss with you. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice evening and see you in the next lecture.